Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, uh, one of ICER's seminars on uh, social and economic policy here in the state of Alaska. I'm Ralph Townsend. I'm the director uh, of ICER. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Matt Berman. Matt Berman is a uh, senior member of ICER's uh, staff. Uh, Matt has done work on perhaps almost all the economic issues of relevance uh, to Alaska. But today's talk specifically deals with uh, uh, the issue of uh, census data. Matt has been engaged in using data of uh, many types and sorts from around Alaska. And of course, census data is uh, core to many of the data collection processes that take place in the country. It's used uh, as, a, as a benchmark. Um, the, uh, in setting this conversation up, um, as the title uh, suggests, uh, the census uh, has faced the issue uh, that as uh, the uh, proliferation of data uh, available on internet sources uh, increases, uh, there's a slight possibility that census data could be used to reveal uh, in, in individual information. And so it has taken some steps or announced some steps to preserve privacy. And today's, uh, is, today's presentation is actually uh, a, a presentation by Matt explaining both why the census is doing it, how he's doing it and why uh, it's, it's more than a technical issue. It actually has been an issue that has, uh, has resulted in at least one court challenge at this point to the process. Uh, that the census has used. So while it is in, in, in a certain sense a technical issue, it's a technical issue uh, because of the importance of census data to a, a wide variety of both research and, and, and also funding distribution issues. Um, how census data is uh, uh, processed uh, is important for a, a wide variety of applications. So before I uh, turn this over to Matt, let me just do a couple of mechanics. Um, the first one is that uh, I will be monitoring the question and answer box. So in these webinars, we use the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, if you put a question into the Q&A, uh, I will at appropriate po point. I'm sorry, is uh, Shirley the only one that lost uh, video from me? Okay, it looks like... Uh, uh, perhaps it's 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 uh, on the receiving end. Okay, thank thank you, David. Uh, um, so, uh, as I said, we'll we'll monitor the Q and A box. <clears throat> I'll inter interrupt as uh, as appropriate. Uh, if you see a question and an a question that you're specifically interested in, please feel free to. Uh, there's a a box to, I think, upgrade it, I think it's called, feel free to do that. Um, also, I, I appreciate this is a, a, a technical seminar. It's a, it's a relatively small group. Uh, if you have a really complicated technical question that you'd like to ask Matt in the Q&A, just say that. Say, uh, I have a technical question about this aspect and I'll try to find an appropriate place to, uh, uh, to interrupt Matt and, uh, and to uh, 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 turn on uh, the speaker so that uh, uh, you can use it. And finally, the last uh, uh, mechanical piece uh, is that uh, we are recording this. Uh, it will be uh, posted after we've had a chance to uh, get the uh, subtext uh, 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 put in for visually impaired uh, users of the, the website. And usually we have that up by Friday or early next week. So uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor of Economics, uh, Matt Berman. Matt, please. Matt, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, okay, th uh, thank you, Ralph, and thank you everybody for joining us on this beautiful spring day. And I will endeavor to share my screen and hopefully this will work. Uh, let me know if it doesn't. All right. Can you can ever can everybody see the screen? Uh, yes, it's there, Matt. Okay. Well, so I'm going to talk today about uh, Census Bureau data and the issue of privacy and accuracy and 
this has become a an issue uh, recently uh, because on the in, on April 12th, the Census Bureau got a lawsuit from Alaska and 15 other states that joined the suit filed by Alabama over the delay in, in releasing the data from 2020 census. And this, the, uh, the issue in, in for Alabama and the other states is really not about congressional redistricting, but about uh, state level redistricting, which is also uh, they're intending to do using a 2020 census data. And the reason the Census Bureau has delayed releasing the data is the count's complete, but they're still perfecting their strategy for protecting privacy and that the new system that they're going to apply is called differential privacy, which I abbreviate here as DP for short. And uh, it's important to note that this is a this litigation is about how the data are reported. It's not at all about the accuracy of the count itself. And that's a separate topic and that could also be litigated. But of course, until the count is released, nobody uh, has any uh, you know, has really any information to know about this other than the Census Bureau itself. So the, uh, the, the lawsuit ra raises a number of questions and it's important to note that the Census Bureau has been using various methods to protect privacy of respondent data for lots of years, for many years, at least since 1980. And so why is there a need for a new strategy? Well, uh, we're gonna talk about that and here's the other questions I, I hope to address in this talk. Um, first, what is differential privacy and why is the Census Bureau deciding to use it? Um, and why is it controversial for the 2020 census? And what are the implications for Alaska as a, uh, an issue? And, and what are the likely outcomes of the litigation? I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to be talking about the, the legal outcomes, but just sort of the policy outcomes. And as we move forward, look forward to the future when data privacy and is going to be increasingly an issue with federal uh, statistics, are there better solutions that we need to consider? And this is, you know, what, what are the right policies to address? Because that, in, in some ways, the Census Bureau has looked at this, but nobody else has because there hasn't really been enough information outside the Census Bureau and a few, you know, specialists, demographers, uh, who really understand the uh, understand the issue, and now this lawsuit is going to bring those out. Okay, so why does the Census Bureau need a new strategy? Well, <laughs> many people are really proud to be stand up and be counted for the census. And this is a, an article that where you notice um, several things. This this person has released her age, her ethnicity, her gender and that she's counted and where she lives as a public matter, public uh, information that's in the, in the paper. Well, that's all the census, 2020 census count asks. And uh, so why is, that, why is that private? Well, not everybody feels that way, of course. And many people are, are just wary of government intrusion on their lives in general. And so it's important to know here that here's the law that the Census Bureau is, a, a, is uh, operating under, which is basically whatever you say to a Census Bureau enumerator is confidential for 70 years, regardless of the contents. And so the Census has this dual mandate because the constitution requires an, enum uh, you know, an accurate count of the population every 10 years. And that number is used for congressional redistricting and state redistricting. It's also uh, subject to challenge under the Voting Rights Act, uh, which needs to know the, the race counts. And census data, it's required for lots of federal and state programs. and, and and uh, you know, billions of hundreds of billions of dollars are allocated around the country annually, including billions just in the state of Alaska. Uh, so, what's happened over the past fifteen or twenty years is this big data revolution that we're familiar with, and it's it's a, it's two things really. It's the well, I guess the three. It's the the exponential increase in computing power with with uh, 
in, you know, increased uh, semiconductor capability. And it's, you know, we have massive databases of information from, from all kinds of electronic media. These are generally private companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter, et cetera. And the internet provides potentially unlimited access to this data from anyone. And so the Census Bureau took this information and their staff, these smart people at Census managed to reconstruct uh, the actual counts of data from the census in 2010 and also the American Community Survey just by combining uh, publicly available data from these other uh, sources and the Census Bureau products that were published and they could identify the majority of people in the, in the nation that way. So they realized that their, act, their prior um, protocols were inadequate. So this is what they used to do. And they used to do things like emitting table cells with small counts. And you know, you'll see that in the, in the data sometimes when you look for, for information in small places. And they sometimes combined categories or geographies. And, and they even switched uh, people from a neighbor so, you know, they, they add up to the same and they're the same in a geographic area, but they're not the same at the individual level. So it makes it harder to identify individuals that way. And I've, I've worked down in the census data center with uh, the source data. And that's how I've got to know a lot of the people in the census who were working on this. And, I, and I've witnessed what they've done with the, with the data. And it, it is, it does introduce some discrepancies, but they're not really apparent in the reporting. And so differential privacy is a completely new uh, approach. And that's a, it's a statistical method. It, it was developed actually by these tech companies that produce the big data so that they can share information with the public about their customers. So some of you may have used Google's uh, data. I know some, my colleague Musin Katabi has used it to, to look at, to track where people are going and uh, that that information is is just from people who have their their uh, tracking allowed on their cell phones, and Google's collecting that data. But when they report it, they're putting some, they're they're using this differential privacy to make it difficult to identify individuals. And so, specifically, differential pro, uh, privacy is a is a mathematical technique that assumes that the probability of identifying an individual's data in the database is proportional to the change in the report and the number that would be caused by taking this person out or adding that person's data to the database. So it's basically a way of saying, if this person's in the data or not, it doesn't make a, enough of a difference in the total for anybody to tell whether that person's data is there or not. And so it's, you know, begging the question of what, what that means about whether what, what you should bother to, to respond to the census if it doesn't matter. Uh, you could think of it really like voting, where in voting, there's not really any reason to vote because the, the probability that you are going to change the outcome of the election is really, really small. But if nobody votes, then you will, you know, the, out, the outcome will be different. And so it's, it's sort of turning the census into something like that. And to protect one person's privacy, you have to protect the person who's the most likely to change the result the most. So, you know, in the census, think about this, if there's a 90 year old person from a, a particular village, if she, she may be the only person over 70 in that, in that village. And so it's impossible to, you know, you figure that the ability to protect her privacy through a differential privacy technique is going to be really strict because she's uh, sort of an outlier, you see. And that, so that's the, the issue that differential privacy has to, to confront. And it's, you know, it's not an issue when you have, you know, like Twitter and you got millions and millions of feeds there, but it is an issue with small populations. And so the way you do it with differential privacy is you take the data and you deliberately put noise into it to change it so that it, you can't tell whether a person is answered or not. And so, yes, yeah, so that's a deliberately adding errors to published numbers. And so 
that's of course why it's controversial. And here's sort of an, you know, a little simple illustration of it. You know, the actual counts, you've got people, are, you know, two animals are obviously different. So the, the statistical disclosure uh, uh, policies like data swapping and things like that, you know, it does change these animals, but you have to look really closely to tell the difference. If you look carefully, you'll see one of the feed is swapped there. Uh, random noise is a lot more intrusive. It basically, you know, can put things in there. And of course, the total has to add up to the number, but the component parts can be quite different than they sh really were. And, and so uh, what are the implications of this? Well, um, the census, it, basically, I'm not going to go into the, the, uh, the technical details of differential, differential privacy. If anybody likes, would like to know, I can send you some great links to uh, Census Bureau documents that explain it very well. Um, but the two questions that are really important are, number one, how much noise do you have to add to the data for Alaska, especially for smaller populations like communities and smaller census areas, uh, their boroughs? How much noise do you have to add to protect privacy? And the second question is, how usable is the data when you do that? And the answer to the first question is, you got to add a lot of noise. And the answer to the second question is, I don't think it's usable. And so to illustrate, you know, the, in, the, in a nod to transparency, the census was very uh, good and published an example that they ran by taking the 2010 census that was already published and, and running a differential privacy algorithm that they developed for the 2020 census on the 2010 census numbers and reporting them again and showing what the comparisons were. And it's not pretty. Um, so in the total, I'm just, so my example I looked at was the Alaska Native Village statistical areas, which are basically every tribe in Alaska. And the tribal areas are in smaller places. They're, they're the village and in larger communities like Juneau or Kenai, it's, it's actually a larger region. And so there are a lot of non-native people living there. And so you can see there in the totals of that for the total population, there's very little difference and there's very little difference for the non-native people at all. But for the native population in there, <laughs> there you see the error bar, so there's actually a margin of error. And it's actually, uh, you know, the true number is within the marginal of error, margin of error, but the actual es estimate is, is substantially biased downward, which is interesting with the noise, uh, you know, what is their algorithm doing? Well, it's putting those people somewhere else. <laughs> uh, and that's not a problem for the state as a whole, but it could be a problem for these tribes if they're getting money allocated based on their population. Uh, and, you know, here it shows it again, uh, the average, the average is a bias downward for Alaska Native people. Um, and when you look at that, well, actually, this is the coefficient of variation, which shows the, uh, it's the margin of error, basically that the, basically think of it as the marginal margin of error divided by the mean. And you see that it's very high for the non-AIN people, non-American Indian Alaska native population, because a lot of these villages have very few uh, non-natives. <laughs> but um, it's still biased downward for the Alaska Native population. Um, and if you look at, uh, at uh, breaking down the population by age groups, the margin of error get much, much larger um, for the average village. I mean, these are really unusable for, for the, you know, the demographic breakdown of these villages. Uh, and I give some little brief examples. I won't spend too time, much time on it, but basically they, they illustrate that for, uh, for the larger hub communities, there's a very slight loss. It's not very great, but you see it's fairly accurate with the noise. And as you get uh, smaller and smaller communities, it's, it gets more of a bias. Uh, one of the places that they're putting these people by accident, which 
they wouldn't know about, but the people at locals in Alaska certainly do, is they end up putting some of them in abandoned villages by, you know, it's because they, their housing units there and they can put them in there with the algorithm and they don't, they don't know that there's nobody there, but of course we do. Uh, so, um, okay, so what can we infer from this? Well, I don't think the data are going to be usable. And it's not just for small communities, but for all populations of less than, um, you know, less than a oh, thousand or so. Um, and the Census Bureau really needs to acknowledge that the law is is producing conflicting mandates, and they can't possibly uh, meet them both. Uh, they can't possibly produce an accurate count for the re for the legislation that Congress has required them to use, and it can't do that and also protect confidentiality as required under the Census Bureau uh, laws. And so, uh, you know, the federal courts may, well, they're going to issue an opinion, they may actually say, well, it's, it's not, uh, you have to show that there's actually harm before you can sue, so they might punt, but sooner or later, uh, it's going to, it's going to get litigated and it will probably reach the Supreme Court if it doesn't if it gets that far and, and at least if it does or if it, some federal appeals court will say Congress has to change the law there's nothing we can do you can't expect judges to sort this out um, so uh, what can we do? You know, if Congress is going to have to change the law, I think, in the long run. Um, and, you know, we can change the policy for what's considered private, and we could change the way that the census is enumerated and specifically give people informed consent. But, but that's, that's, that's potentially a problem. You know, that requires change in federal law, really. So this is a real conundrum. And and uh, what's interesting here, uh, I'm now speaking from my perspective as a, as a researcher, as a social science researcher, is that Congress has actually confronted this problem before. And it's from the human subjects research uh, laws. And everybody who's listening here who's a social scientist who's done research using federal funds or at the university, is familiar with this. Um, we take training and we, we can't do research with people until we get it, take a training course. And one of those, you know, one of the important things that we learn in those, in the, in the training course about the federal requirements. And I've just listed a few of the main ones here that the people who are being asked need to provide informed consent. And they can they can withdraw at any time if they don't think they want to continue. That's not in the census legislation. And perhaps more importantly, the researchers have to consider the risk of harm from the inadvertent disclosure. So in the census case, the law makes absolutely no distinction between whether your house is occupied and your citizenship. And just think about that. The law doesn't make a difference. But what could cause more harm if it's disclosed, if your identity, you know, your citizenship is disclosed versus whether you live in a certain place, house disclosed. Or, or consider this way, if you're Donald Trump, what's the risk of harm if your tax returns are are disclosed, you know, your, your income that you would you told the census is disclosed. So you could say, oh, you got your tax returns. You either lied on your taxes or you lied to the Census Bureau. You know, what's the risk of that versus knowing his, his age and gender? You see, they're clearly different in their potential harm. I mean, think about gender. Gender is a, you know, when you're asking, you're asking about your sex, but people will report it's self-reported. So they'll report their gender identity and that's their public. It, that's their public expression of themselves. So, that's not really that private. Um, nobody's looking at their birth certificate. It's like your uh, your gender identity and and your race is 
people uh, self-report their racial identity so they can say, uh, they, you know, they maybe they need a, a category saying do not wish to disclose, but basically it's not really private. And, and so the, the, the uh, human research subjects law requires that there uh, requires higher levels of potential harm from disclosure requires st uh, stricter protocols to protect privacy. And so it specifically say that if the risk of harm is higher, you have to take more care at protecting that information. And, and finally, we have an institutional review board, which is a, a group of people in, at the university, there are peers, but they're people who are not involved in our research. And they review our plans, make sure we've got informed consent and, and we've considered the, the risks there and we've disclosed those to the potential subjects, research subjects. And that IRB, as we abbreviate it, reviews our and approves our plans and then oversees the implementation. And if we're, there's a, a data a privacy breach, we have to report it immediately and they could shut down our, they could shut down our, our, our study and uh, sanction, sanction us for, you know, possibly. And so, you know, the key difference with this and differential privacy is that we're, we're familiar, differential privacy addresses a trade-off between privacy and accuracy. And I put this little picture here about the, you know, the, the theoretical change that comes from uh, uh, this article by about in Schmitty in the American Economic Review in 2018 that discusses this, this trade-off as a matter of public policy. And I should mention that John Ebaud is the Census Bureau's chief privacy officer, uh, professor of economics at, at Cornell and the, the director for the Census Bureau of of uh, of data, you know, data. It's the it, there. He's the director of, of research at the Census Bureau. So he's both in the academic community and he's in the you know a, a senior officer in the Census Bureau. Now, I, I know there's some people who believe. Who uh, I've heard this, people spreading rumors that this whole differential privacy initiative is a uh, a conspiracy from uh, well, pick your pick your party to mess with the census for you know pick your aim. You know, it could be coming from either side. Um, let me assure you that that is absolutely false. This is, comes from the bowels of the deep state. You can't get any really any deeper than John about and the Census Bureau staff, and they have, they have, uh, they are the ones that internally said we have to do something about this. And you know, I liken it to uh, engineers. They're engineers. They're trying to design a bridge over very uh, dangerous waters. And they want to make sure the bridge isn't going to fall down. What they're not able to do because it's not their job is to see that the bridge is a bridge to nowhere. You know, they're not going, you know, they, they can't accomplish the objective with differential privacy because the outcome, you get to the other side and you have unusable results. And people aren't going to use them. They aren't going to use the data. And if they aren't going to use the data, people are going to say, "Why bother to to participate?" So, you know, see, it's it's a it's a problem that has to be resolved by changing, really changing the whole uh, outcome. And, and to date, the policymaking people haven't really got involved. The litigation is great a great wake up call that. They need to get involved and they need to figure it, figure this out. And so, you know, the trade-off that we want is not just accuracy and privacy, but the trade-off between the risk of harm and the benefit that's derived from the public of the information that's provided. And that's something that that public benefit really has to be addressed through our 
our, our elected officials. Um, you know, I, 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 the, the, I, I predicted two years ago that, that we were gonna have litigation over this when I first saw this from the Census Bureau and discussed it with them, um, with the staff people, some of the same people who are involved here. And they were determined to press on, but I predicted that the lawsuit would happen, oh, well, when the numbers were published and there was a voting rights suit from somebody because the Census Bureau couldn't prove that the numbers accurately counted the number of minorities in a certain area that was in, included in a gerrymandered district, <laughs> legislative district, or even congressional district. They couldn't prove that the count was accurate. Well, all that's happened is the soak suits happened a little earlier, but I, you know, we knew it was coming, but it isn't, it's got, now it's got to get past the, the uh, lawyers and to our elected officials as really it's Congress and the administration. So that's about all I have uh, to say right now, but I'm happy to answer questions and I will have this talk available. Uh, the uh, slides will be available with the recording. Um, so Matt, I, I have exactly the sort of question I think that you're worried about. Uh, David O'Brien asks, for those of us who work in Alaska Public Health, we use the US Census data uh, to calculate incidence and mortality rates by age group and race. Without accurate census data, uh, we can no longer provide this information by age and race to disease control programs for working with communities. Uh, those of us who collect data and dis disease surveillance also won't be able to work directly with communities and have concerns about perceived high rates of diseases. How can we use the 2020 census to continue to provide those important health services? And he uh, says, from your presentation, it sounds like you can't. Uh, David, I'm gonna turn on uh, your uh, uh, speaker so you can uh, talk. And uh, Matt, you wanna take a shot at the answer and then perhaps uh, have an exchange with David on this? Well, yes. Uh, so approximately, well, I guess it was December, 2019. So it was before the COVID you know, pandemic shut everything down. But in December of 2019, the National Academy of Sciences, which has a, has a, uh, a national statistics working group. Uh, and that working group, which is led by a, a senior uh, statistician, and a very senior, you know, very well-regarded statistician, Connie Citro, uh, they organized a meeting in Washington D.C. for people to come and talk about it, and I I, attend, I had the I was fortunate to be able to attend that, and I was there, and I saw well who was who else was there the stakeholders here, well it was state demographers, including the Alaska uh, folks the Alaska state demographers who who presented a very nice presentation of their take on the. Uh, on the set that demonstration product I talked about, uh, they were focused on, on they weren't focused on race. They were focused on other population numbers. But, but it was, um, it was, <laughs> they were there, uh, as were other state demographers, and also there were the, there were two other groups of people. One was the social service providers, who were concerned about the money they'd get for the programs that need to run and their ability to evaluate whether they were working. And, and the other was from the public health people. They were generally academic public health people like yourself. And, and they were very concerned exactly about the issue you raised, which was, I remember one of the uh, people there who spoke was a, was a researcher at, I believe at Harvard, who was doing research on, on uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And, you know, there's an example where you need the age breakdown uh, as well as race to make any sense of, of trying to look at spread of, of, of gonorrhea, for example. Uh, and, and of course you need it for looking at monitoring who's, who's getting COVID and who's dying too. You need those numbers for public policy related to public health as well as for research. And the Census Bureau got the message, but there's basically nothing they can do about it. It is a problem, and you're absolutely right. 
Uh, David, did you have any follow up on that? You're, you're, you can, you're open. No, it, it sounds like we're, I'm, I'm kind of uh, preaching to the, to the choir. Uh, I happen to work in the field of uh, cancer surveillance and uh, the cancer surveillance community has uh, known that this was coming for uh, the last several years and we were uh, pretty, uh, well, I don't know if, if the word horrified is, is the right term, but we realized that if uh, differential privacy was con continued, if that plan was continued to be used and, and uh, um, uh, and um, and we weren't able to be given um, uh, data before it was uh, um, uh, scrambled using this algorithm, then uh, our our jobs would be uh, very difficult uh, in the future to to be able to because uh, we we need that data by by age group and by race so that we can uh, calculate age adjusted rates and compare. Uh, cancers for uh, different regions around the state. Yes, I, I understand completely. I have a research project that we just finished. I'm trying to work on publishing the results that was on suicide prevention in communities in rural Alaska. And what, what we were trying to do was actually compare protective factors in communities that had low suicide rates with, with those who didn't and try to see, well, what is, what is, what is, what is in these communities that's protecting these people? So that required, <laughs> that required me to calculate age-adjusted suicides rates at the community level, where most of the suicides are actually young Alaska Native men. And right. that, uh, you know, we, I did that using 2010 census, and it can't be done in, with 2010. You know, it's like, okay, well, we might, uh, we can publish results, but we won't be able to to see if they actually hold up over time because numbers won't be available. And that's, uh, it's disturbing because it says, well, the most accurate count for this current population is not the 2020 census reporting, but it's actually the 2010 census numbers, which you know are obviously out of date. So it's, it's a problem. That's, <laughs> and and it's, 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 I guess it's time that the community speak up because that's the only way that, you know, our, our elected officials know that they have to do something. Right. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, Matt, there are two questions here from Heather Hudson uh, that are related. One is, uh, have you published this anyplace or are there public, I think more broadly, are there publications out there that uh, summarize this issue and the second one, uh, is both your involvement and perhaps uh, other technical involvements uh, in filing uh, evidence in the briefs that have actually been uh, sub uh, that have been filed or the legal briefs? Well, I, I've uh, I'm aware that you know this the legal briefs are are not. Uh, I mean, I imagine at some point the the legal briefs aren't public, and they will become public when the if the if the issue is litigated, I suppose actually goes to trial, which I, I'm not sure that it will. But no, I'm not. I haven't seen any of the, the, the legal this development. You know, the suit lawsuit is is basically only about three weeks old from Alabama, you know, at, or you know, it's about a month old from Alabama and three the state. So it's not very. It hasn't been very much time, and I don't think people have written the, written it yet. But you know, I don't. I I said I I think it's not worth while to get into the weeds of it because <clears throat> I mean you can but you know that <clears throat> it's it's because it's it's so clearly infeasible that it's just can't it can't possibly happen uh, you know I can I could talk further about why I think that's true but I I, I don't I mean there are probably published uh, I mean you can read that if you want to to read the uh, the, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure what has actually been published other than the presentations that people have made. It's, uh, you know, until the numbers are published, you can't really write about the, the consequences. There's lots of literature about differential privacy and how it would be implemented in the 2020 census, but not a lot about what the actual consequences are because the Census Bureau has to release the numbers first. 
So Matt, I have a question. Uh, I, I, I vaguely understand this household issue and perhaps you can explain it a little more for me. Uh, and I'll sort of make it a two part question. So why do people get put in these communities that have no residents? I guess it's because there are buildings there. And I guess my second part of the question is, so is there a bias, for example, that communities with lots of recreational homes will tend to get people added to them? Or is there some sort of consistent bias related to the way the census is using household units? Yeah, well, I, that, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I could have answered that a little bit more, but so when I, I talked about this with the state demographers, uh, because obviously they were concerned about it and they were looking into it and we, we, we dove deeper into the census, this 2010 demonstration file, which you can uh, find at the Census Bureau and play with it yourself, download the entire census uh, of 2010. It's a pretty lot of data, but you, you, can, you can download and look at it, but, and they did as did a number of other state demographers, um, including, I should mention, our former state demographer, Eddie Hunsinger, who's uh, now, who, who at that time was actually, had recently been named the state demographer of California. And he was representing California and he's very knowledgeable about this issue and really smart guy. Um, and and we, we determined that the, well, so yes, you're right, there, there are buildings there and the Census Bureau is assuming that because you can see these, these structures from, you know, basically from Google Earth, they're public, you know there's a building there and, and, but you don't know whether it's occupied and you don't know whether, whether it's seasonal or year round. And so without knowing more about the information about, about seasonal homes, which they don't, you know, they don't get in the census, right? There's no way to do that. So, so where do these, where, when I noticed that there was a bias in uh, small communities, where are those people placed? Well, they're put in, they're put in, in you know, not just these abandoned villages, but they're put in, uh, in the, sort of the rural areas that have, you know, their cabins, their trappers cabins, their, you know, fish camps. There are various buildings there that are seasonally used, but they're not uh, year-round homes anymore. Now that there's, you know, there's people have had to go to school, but but the the uh, rural Alaskans maintain these homes because they, you know, these buildings, cabins basically, because they use them seasonally. And so yes, they get put there, and so you find that the, they get moved out of villages back onto the land, which is sort of interesting. <laughs> interesting in itself, it, it would be interesting if it was if it were true, but it isn't true. It's just that's uh, you know, and they may they may be able to correct that when they issue the final numbers because it's been pointed out to them. But uh, it's it's one of these things where you've got to. Uh, you know, there's an overall privacy budget from producing accurate information. And the more accurate your information in your published results about one issue, one aspect of the population, you've got to make it more inaccurate for others. It's like a, you know, one of these things where you push it in, it's bulging out on one side, you push it in and then it bulges out somewhere else. And there's just not really any, uh, any way to fix it overall. Um. I have a question here about, uh, you mentioned that there hadn't been much published in terms of the impact. I guess I'll ask a two part, or, or modify this question in two directions. One, is there anything published that, that identifies uh, the impacts on either Alaska natives or uh, perhaps uh, American natives uh, in general? Uh, and uh, uh, in terms, and the second question was, is this one of the issues that Alaska raised in its uh, uh, brief, or you, you don't know what issues Alaska raised, why Alaska intervened, uh, or I think is it either an intervener or, or, or is it a, a co-filer in that case? You know, Alaska filed a brief in support of Alabama and joined by 
uh, all these other states. They're mostly Republican-led states, so it's it's interesting that this has become looked like a partisan issue. Although, uh, really, any state that faces a potential voting rights uh, problem is is vulnerable, and and that would include most of the states in the union. They just they haven't figured it out yet, uh, but. Uh, I haven't seen that. I said I haven't seen what's filed in the brief, and if there are, there is published research on the implications. It's all going to be based on this 2010 demonstration file that the Census Bureau released. There are a few things there that I've seen, uh, and I could, you know, I could send you a link to to a couple things people point out to me, but they're really not nothing that's, uh, that I know of that's addressing the Native, pop, uh, you know, Native American population specifically. It's, it's not, it, it's basically a problem for small places. And so, you know, the Navajo Nation is going to be counted accurately uh, because they've got, you know, a large population and it's concentrated geographically. But some of the, you know, the, in California, you've got these rancherias with, with a few hundred people that were uh, that are reservations. Uh, some of them have casinos and are wealthy, and some of them are impoverished. Uh, and that's why Cal you know that's something that California people are very much aware of. But I'm not aware of any. You know, there may be something there, and uh, if, if somebody knows of it, you could put it in the chat window for people. And but that's. You know, I don't know about it. It's this is this is. Uh, I said it's one of these things that as soon as the numbers are published, you're going to get a flurry of of uh, interest. But right now, it's not really uh, that widely known, unfortunately. So, so I have a question from Lance uh, Lance Howe, and that is, uh, he said, I understand the decennial census short form has been published the same way for many years. Why is the potential for a privacy breach greater now than in the past? If it's just linking census data with other types of data, don't all other types of data already have the basic demographics that could be gleaned from the census short form? So, do you well, Lance, Lance uh, as you know, the census is a count, it's not a sample. All the other uh, databases out there from the Census Bureau are samples. So it's a different question with a sample because you you don't know whether an individual has been sampled or not. That's actually private as well. And so it's another layer of problem. You know, the, the census has, has talked about the need to in, impose differential privacy on the American Community Survey and other uh, of its surveys, but they haven't done that yet. And one of the reasons I think is that they're aware that when you're putting uh, you know, implementing differential privacy on a survey, the theory that justifies differential privacy and the ability to uh, determine how much noise you need to add to make it private, that theory does not apply to samples because you, you know it comes from it comes from Microsoft actually originally and uh, the, the uh, researcher that first developed it was you know, Cynthia Dvork, who was a, 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 a privacy officer for Microsoft. And, and they, they are not dealing with samples, they're dealing with, you know, the a population as well. And so it, it's going to need a lot more work. And I'm not sure they're ever going to, to get there. But yeah, the, 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 the reason for the new concern is, is this private data that is available and it's on widely available on the internet. You know, you can go look up your your voter registration, and you can find you know pretty much anybody who's registered to vote. You can find their age and address, and and that you know that kind of information, yeah, you know, on the internet makes it really easy for somebody to identify an individual, for example. And then you you combine that with uh, some social, you know, Facebook pay, posts and, and your Facebook page. I mean, it, your, uh, you know, the it's just there's just more and more information there, and more and more people using 
large computers to to try to use it for marketing and that makes it so much easier to identify people in the census than it, than it was in say 2010 or 20, 2000 certainly. Well, um, thank you very much, Matt, for uh, this presentation on a topic that uh, I think for researchers, as uh, David in particular noted, uh, is really important. Uh, this idea of using census, census data has sort of permeated what many of us uh, come to expect of data sets uh, across the country. So uh, I really appreciate uh, your taking the time, Matt, to present this topic and explain it to us. Um, as I said at the beginning of the uh, presentation, we, we have recorded this and once we get it uh, the uh, 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 transcribed, uh, we will uh, get a transcription on the bottom of the screen for it. Uh, we will post it uh, on the ISO website uh, and so you'll be able to uh, access this uh, talk there. So thank you very much, Matt. We really appreciate your time and uh, good day to everybody who's uh, joined us for this uh, presentation. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. And, and just, a, just a note of uh, caution, if anybody in the Census Bureau gets this, I'm very sympathetic to them. And just because I said they're building a bridge to nowhere is not their fault. It's, you know, they didn't write the law. They're just trying to carry it out. Thanks very much, Matt. All right, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.